Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Ayana Teal, the Administrative Coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center. And on behalf of the Training Center and the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we'd like to welcome you to the October 17th Public, public Health Practice Grand Rounds making health reform happen, how Maryland is implementing the Affordable Care Act. I have a few announcements, especially for those watching, watching online. Um, if you could take the time out to sign in for us, that would be greatly appreciated. It's just a few questions that will take less than a minute. We just wanna let our federal funders know that people are actually tuning in and watching us today. Right under that link is an email link. You can send an email question or comment at any point during, during the presentation and we will have a Q&A session immediately following the presentation. And then at the bottom of the screen is an evaluation that you can fill out after viewing the presentation um, to, just to give us feedback so that we can improve and meet your needs better. We are very happy to have with us today Carolyn Quatraki, Rebecca Pierce, and Vinny DeMarco. I'm gonna introduce Vinny and he will introduce our other speakers. Um, Vinny DeMarco is a longtime advocate for public health causes, including reducing teen smoking and gun violence and expanding healthcare access and the subject of the new book of the, from the, by the former FTC Chair and Advocacy Institute co-founder entitled The DeMarco Factor, Transforming Public Will into Political Power. You really should pick up this book, it's great. As president of the Maryland Citizens Health Initiative, he's working to guarantee quality, affordable health care for all Marylanders. And as an adjunct assistant professor of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, he is working to educate public health students from around the world on effective methods of advocating for public health policies. And I also happen to personally know that he sends his, his wife flowers just because, and that's the, <laughs> stuff, that's the stuff that really counts. So if you all would welcome Benny DeMarco and he'll introduce our other speakers. Thank you, Ayana, for the sweet introduction and for hosting this. We love the Maryland Public Health Training Center, and Ayana does a great job, great job there. And uh, thank you all for being here uh, in person or by um, webcast. Uh, the, we're here today to talk about the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, and how it's being implemented and going to be implemented in Maryland. As we all know here, I hope, the Affordable Care Act is a great public health victory for America. It's going to expand health care to over 30 million people who didn't have it, make health care more affordable uh, for all of us. A tremendous public health victory. Presidents have been trying to do that since 1900. And we got it done uh, under President Obama, and it's a great um, victory we should all be very proud of. One of the things, though, about this law that's important to understand is that, especially after the Supreme Court decision, there's a lot of discretion in the states. States have a lot of discretion on how they implement the Affordable Care Act, which in our country is a very important way to make, make laws work. And um, we want to talk here about how this law is going to be implemented and has been implemented in Maryland. Two days after President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act, Governor Martin O'Malley, Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, and Secretary of Health Josh Shar Sharfstein held a press conference to say, we in Maryland strongly support that law, and we're going to do everything we can to take full advantage of it and fully implement it here. That was very important to those of us in the advocacy community who want this law fully implemented. I have colleagues across the country who grind their teeth about what's happening in their states, who are so upset about states where the governor and the legislature either are slow in implementing the law, or s tried to sue to get it repealed, or not fully funding it, are just really negative on the law. And they're all jealous of us, as they should be. Uh, we in Maryland are really doing this right. After the governor held that press conference, he did one very important thing, is he chose a woman named Carolyn Katraki, who I'll introduce in a second, to be the head of the health reform uh, office uh, that, he, that he put together, and he created task force to figure out how to fully implement this law. There are two parts of the law that really now have a lot to do, that states have a lot of discretion on. The Medicaid, which you'll hear about, expansion, and the exchange. The exchange, as you'll hear more about, is a way that we can make health care affordable and accessible to many, many thousands of Marylanders, millions of Americans. But states have a lot of leeway on how to put together that exchange and make it happen. So in Maryland, the governor, Lieutenant Governor Brown, Secretary Sharstein, put together a task force in which advocates like myself, consumers, business, labor, people from all across um, 
the state came together. Matt Chantano, our deputy director, was heavily involved in this. And we all talked and figured out how to fully implement the exchange, how to make it happen. I can tell you it was a tremendous process. Many of you in this room and on email have been part of it and are part of it. It's a lot of work, but it was really open, transparent, and a great uh, a public, public process uh, to, make this, to make this happen. And through these processes, we, we passed two laws in uh, 2011 and 2012 to begin to fully implement um, the Affordable Care Act through the health care healthcare exchange. And um, the great thing, two couple great things happened. A board was created, chaired by Dr. Sharfstein, who's absolutely amazing and wonderful. And the members on that board are really consumer-oriented, great people. And they hired a tremendous person to, um, to head it, to be the staff person, uh, Becca Pierce, who we'll introduce after Carolyn. So they have a great board, a great staff, and laws which are really designed to fully implement it. One thing I just want to mention before I introduce Carolyn, one of the key issues in an exchange is whether the exchange is going to have the power to really make health care affordable. And there's always opposition to that by people who kind of like the status quo exactly as it is and benefit from it. So we had to really fight for that. And the O'Malley-Brown administration and, and many of us advocates really fought to make sure that the exchange has that authority, something called active purchasing, which the Massachusetts Exchange has and is working well. And we have that in Maryland. So we have the structure now to really fully implement the Affordable Care Act in, in a terrific way. You're going to hear now from Carolyn and Becca, who are going to tell you in detail how this law is being implemented here, and then we'll take questions uh, after they're, they're done. We are very lucky to have the two of them here. They're amongst the nation's best healthcare, healthcare leaders. And Carolyn, I want to introduce first, a longtime friend of mine. We worked together in the Attorney General's office. She's a longtime assistant to... Um, uh, Joe Curran, where she worked on many issues, including, I remember fondly, trying to reduce gun violence. She did a lot with the Attorney General on that. She um, uh, a law degree from Yale University and BA from Northwestern. She's clerked for federal judges, worked at private law firms, and before her present job was the legislative assistant uh, in the legislative office of Governor O'Malley. And in that office, she did a lot to help us enact in 2007 substantial health care expansion in Maryland, going from 34th to 14th in health care coverage for people, expanding health care over 300,000 people could not have happened without Carolyn's work. And a lot of what we did that year helped to lead to the uh, Affordable Care Act. And now, as I said, she, we're really thrilled that she was chosen by Governor O'Malley to be the director of the Office of, of Health Reform. And I want to introduce and uh, listen to, we're all going to listen to eagerly to uh, Carolyn Katraki. Carolyn? Well, you all don't know what a feat it was for me to just walk across the stage like that. <laughs> um, first of all, um, thank you so much, Vinny. Uh, I'll get to, a, get to in a minute how important Vinny and his, his advocacy organization, Healthcare for All, has been to our efforts. Um, but I want to say just on a personal note, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I was supposed to, to give this talk back in July. Um, and some great people uh, stood in for me at the last minute because I actually, ironically, at a healthcare reform conference out in Portland, broke my leg really badly. And so I want to also give a shout out to my wonderful surgeon, Dr. Greg Osgood, just down the street, who just this morning, coincidentally enough, said I can junk these crutches as long as my, you know, <laughs> as soon as my leg is strong enough. So um, uh, I'm on, on my way back. So that feels terrific. Um, I, I'm going to give you sort of the overview of all the various things we've been doing, and then Becca um, will go into a lot more detail about the health benefit exchange. Um, I always start off talking about this that to, to make a note that as we have moved forward on a lot of different fronts, we really have tried to keep in mind the goal, not, not just making reform happen for its own sake or even to, to, to expand coverage for, you know, to make sure people are covered for its own sake, but to really try to improve health. And I think that's important when you look at all the various arenas that we have to be operating in to make this um, implemented effectively. The other thing I, I have to emphasize from the outset 
and I'll come back to this because it informs and infuses so much of what is happening and has happened, is that we tried from the beginning to take a very collaborative approach. You know, this kind of change affects everybody. All of the stakeholders, the providers, the carriers, the small businesses, the consumers, the individuals, the advocacy organizations, we, we didn't want it to be just sort of what we in government think ought to happen in terms of implementing this law, but we've, we've really, I think, to the extent that we've been successful and we're proud of it, it's been because of the input of so many, so many terrific advocates. And that's where I'll, I'll, I'll give kudos to Vinny and his leadership um, and, and his organization, among many others, but they have been particularly terrific in helping us, um, you know, at key moments, getting active purchasing authority for the exchange and, and those kinds of key moments when you really need people to step forward and say, this is the right thing to do. Um, in, in sort of understanding what we've, we've done um, and are doing, we sort of think of the, the Affordable Care Act as having sort of four basic components. Um, the first is this, you know, the insurance market reform, so that me, so that coverage that people are going to get will be meaningful. And um, you're familiar with a lot of these things that have already gone into effect. I have personal experience with keeping kids on, on insurance policies till age 26. Um, no lifetime limits anymore on benefits. You can see there I've given statistics on how many Marylanders are already benefiting from these reforms. In 2014, the one you hear most about, no longer any exclusions for pre-existing conditions or annual limits. Women are well, will no longer be discriminated against in terms of premiums they pay because they're women. Um, and then preventive services, which are so critical to, to reducing costs and keeping people healthy in the first place. Um, a lot of additional preventive services available at no cost for women, again, in particular. Um, the second piece is expanding access. Um, the Medicaid expansion, I've given you numbers up there. These are our sort of best projections as to how many people will be able to cover by the end of the decade under the Medicaid expansion and then through the exchange, again, which you'll hear a lot more about. So if we do this, you know, as effectively as we can, we hope to reduce our number of uninsured by half by 2020. The, the third piece is, you know, you can't, as we learn, you know, as we all focused on with the Supreme Court decision and the individual mandate, you can't force people to buy insurance and have insurance if, you, if it's not affordable. So the Medicaid expansion um, up to 133% of FPL is really critical in that regard. The small business tax credits, um, making it easier for small employers to provide coverage. And then, of course, the tremendous influx of, of um, assistance from the individual subsidies through the exchange. Um, the last piece, which in the long run may be the hardest one of all, you know, we, we're, all of this is not going to be successful in the long run if we can't reduce the co underlying costs of why coverage is so expensive, and, and that's the underlying cost of healthcare itself, and enhancing the quality at the same time that we're making it more efficient and, and less costly. So there, we, it's one of those things you have to sort of a, attack from all different angles, and a lot of it, you know, has to come organically from the private sector. Um, but, you know, the categories of sort of wellness and prevention and the new care delivery systems that are being, you know, pioneered in institutions like this. Um, and then health IT, which has been a priority of the governor from the beginning, even before the Affordable Care Act was signed. Um, but we need to take advantage of those new advancements in technology to, to uh, work towards this goal. Um, so how have we brought these benefits to Maryland? As Vinny said, you know, um, from detractors of the Affordable Care Act, you hear a lot, it's this federal takeover of health care, you know, top-down kind of thing. But it really isn't. I mean, it puts the tools in place for states, but states really have a lot of discretion into, in how they implement this act. So as, as Vinny said, the governor, a couple days after the Affordable Care Act was signed into law by President Obama, he um, signed an executive order which created a bipartisan joint legislative and executive branch coordinating council um, with, you know, the key health policy and budget leaders in the state and charged that council with taking a hard look at the Affordable Care Act and, and working with a lot of stakeholders, six different work groups, you know, many, many, many meetings over a period of a year, come up with a set of recommendations as to how we can best implement this law here in Maryland. 
Um, they're divide, those recommendations are sort of divided roughly into five categories. The first, which was really the last, but they recognize through this long process that this is a complicated long, uh, sort of ongoing long-term undertaking and that it would benefit with ongoing leadership and coordination. So that led to the creation of my office and also extended the life of the Coordinating Council, which was originally just going to be in existence for a year but is still ongoing and active. Um, the second category, the, the exchange, the insurance market reforms, which I've talked about, and Medicaid expansion. I'm going to give very short shrift to this because Becca's going to go into a lot of it. But we did get, we were one of the first states in the country to pass the initial law that established the governance and structure of the exchange. As Vinny said, they've gotten up and running. Um, one, one thing that we did um, have a lot of sort of back and forth about and ended up with a hybrid of there were those that thought it should be a nonprofit, those that thought it ought to be a government agency. So we really tried to take the best of both worlds. We wanted there to be that sort of inclusiveness and accountability that is associated with government, but to have more flexibility in hiring and procurement than, than, than you know, strictly straight state agencies. So I think we, we, we got the best of both worlds in that regard. We have a terrific board of directors and a really terrific executive director, as you will see in a minute. Um, those are some of the policy decisions that we, we um, implemented in the second act, this the second piece of legislation that was passed this past session. And again, Becca will talk more about that. Um, here again are just the numbers on the Medicaid expansion um, and the subsidies. And just a quick point about this. Again, you know, contrary to what you hear from detractors of Obamacare, we um, did an independent study. Um, and we didn't do it, but we you know, commissioned an independent study of what the economic benefits of the exchange and the Medicaid expansion would mean for Maryland. And, and as you can see from this chart, we're getting this huge influx of, of federal dollars into the health system that will then in, in turn, as people get covered and, and access care for the first time in, in a more sustained way, will increase expenditures and create new jobs. So the next category, um, again, as I said, maybe in the long term, the toughest not to crack, um, healthcare delivery and payment reform. Um, right here, we're, we're, there are a number of initiatives going on, again, ongoing. Um, one, of, one of your own, uh, John Colmers, who was the, the former uh, health secretary and um, the current medical director, they're co-chairing a committee that's really trying to take a look at the clinical innovations that are being sort of, you know, that, are, that various providers and health systems are experimenting with and, and trying to make work, marrying them with the financial incentives and mechanisms, um, and then into integrated programs, trying to shine a light on those programs that are really holding a lot of promise that show, show that they are, in fact, going to be a good way to go. Um, we, we created actually before, again, before the Affordable Care Act, the Health Quality and Cost Council, which is, again is a group of folks taking another, um, taking a look at, again, a lot of these issues. Um, one of their big initiatives was a medical home pilot, an all-payer patient-centered medical home pilot, which is up and running, and CareForce, of course, is doing another one. Um, a very important initiative last year was to really focus on and, and and try to reduce health disparities, not only because it's the right thing to do, um, and we, we have a lot of health disparities still in Maryland, but also it's a cost driver. And, and so it's, again, another way to sort of try to deliver care, um, better care for, for less money. Um, balancing incentives payment program, we got a grant for long-term care reform, and there are a couple of other examples up there. Um, the next category, even if we do this incredibly, if it, you know, effectively as well as we can, unfortunately, we still will have thousands of Marylanders who will remain uninsured. Um, you know, undocumented Im immigrants are one category, but there are, there will be others. And so, it's important that we maintain and enhance the strength of our public health system, our, our safety net providers, and um, you see there there are a number of initiatives going on to try to do that. We're getting grants from the federal government to this end, um, more money for community health centers, which is obviously really important in this regard. Um, Next, workforce development. You know, the good news is we'll have all these additional folks covered um, and, and accessing care, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't get you there if you don't have the providers 
um, to provide that care and the right kind of providers to provide the right kind of care. And again, that's where you have to, we, we feel like we really have to try to marry the delivery system reform with the workforce development initiatives. Um, so we're, we've, we've taken a kind of comprehensive look at it through the Governor's Workforce Investment Board. Um, and we're just now trying to start more, try to, trying to look again, we've been sort of, you know, focused on these deadline driven uh, uh, developments that, that we've had to meet these federal deadlines. And this one doesn't have a deadline and it doesn't have quite the, you know, script <laughs> um, in the Affordable Care Act. Um, but we think that, you know, again, workforce development initiatives have to come from the private sector, but we're really trying to take a look at what we can do in government um, with our stakeholders to help facilitate that. Um, look at align, you know, aligning training opportunities with the new delivery system models, better data collection, and and maybe looking at some barriers to credentialing and, and licensing. Um, last category: communications and outreach. Um, this again is where where Vinny's group and a lot of advocates come in to really help us leverage this effort. But you know all of this great stuff that's going on and the, and the benefits of the Affordable Care Act that are being brought to Marylanders, again, you need people to know about it, to understand it, and to know what they need to do to access it. So we're working, and, and increasingly the exchange is, is standing up a really comprehensive marketing um, uh, effort. This is our website, our new, that we launched about, not, about six months ago, I guess, that we really tried to make more consumer centric and to divide the groups of consumers, small businesses, families and individuals and, and seniors to, to give them a way to sort of really understand what it means for them and what they need to do to access the benefits. And then Marilyn, moving forward up there, if you're interested as a stakeholder in, in these policy developments, um, that there's a special section for for stakeholders. Last thing I'll talk about, essential health benefits. We just completed this task. Um, the, the Affordable Care Act requires that every policy in the individual and small group markets beginning 2014 that will be sold will have to contain a core set of essential health benefits. We expected the federal government to, to define this set of benefits, um, but for the first two years they've directed states instead to pick a plan, existing plan in their state from among ten options. Um, and that, that benchmark plan will serve as the core set of essential health benefits for Maryland. They all, all um, plans must cover the 10 categories of services you see up there. And just last month, September 27th, the Coordinating Council selected the State Employee Health Plan as our, um, our essential health benefits benchmark plan. So with that, I will wait for questions until um, after Becca speaks. And thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. That was uh, excellent, and we learned a whole lot, um, a whole lot from her. Uh, one, one of the first things that um, the uh, uh, new exchange did was find who would be the head of it, and that's a very important, very important thing for someone who's going to run uh, such a complicated institution as a healthcare exchange. And we're lucky for all of us, um, Josh Sharfstein and the board found uh, Becca. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she's not she's not as well known to many of us here as, as Carolyn. So let me tell you about her. Uh, Becca is executive director of what's now called the Maryland um, Health Health Connection, and she has been in health insurance for over nine years. She spent six years in product development at Care First and Owings Mills, Maryland where she had the opportunity to manage almost every product or segment in the market, including the small and large group markets, the Delaware market, the Medicare market, the HMO, PPO, Vision, the Pharmacy Care Management, and Affinity product lines. As the director of small group markets, she worked with the Maryland Healthcare Commission to modify the comprehensive standard health benefit plan, benefits to stay within a statutory requirements. Ms. Pierce then Beckham then moved to Kaiser Permanente to manage the Medicare Advantage product nationally. Most recently, she was a director of benefits administration, where she was responsible for negotiating and implementing, implementing benefit uh, exemptions for major national companies throughout the Kaiser Permanente organization. In this role, she also helped to develop Kaiser Permanente's national preventive health package, uh, preventive benefit package required by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Beck has, has her undergraduate degree from Washington University in St. Louis and her MBA from the University of Maryland College Park, and she resides in Baltimore County. And again, we are very lucky to have her. And in the short time she's been here, we at, in the advocacy community have been really impressed and thrilled that she's uh, doing, doing this for us here in Maryland. So, Becca? 
Blah, blah, blah. I need to update my bio. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, are there slides somewhere? Uh, right there. Um, hi, everybody. Um, as Vinny said, I'm Becca Pierce. I'm the Executive Director of Maryland Health Benefit Exchange, now known as the Maryland Health Connection. Um, so thank you for allowing me to be here today. I'm going to give you a quick background on the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange, um, talk about the impacts to the individuals and the small businesses, and then where we are from an implementation perspective. So what is a health insurance exchange? You know, the Affordable Care Act lays out um, that each state is required to have a health insurance exchange by 2014, which is essentially a marketplace where individuals and small businesses can actually go online and, and, and search for, um, uh, for health insurance. It is not the federal government taking over health insurance. Hi. It is, um, uh, it is what I often talk about is the Travelocity, the Expedia of um, uh, really just a, a, a website for people to go and, or, and purchase health insurance that already exists in the market. Um, the important thing about it, too, is that it's really a no wrong door entrance for people into Medicaid or into the uh, commercial market. Um, so it's not just commercial exchange. It's, it's going to be eligibility determinations for people to figure out the right place for them to get insurance. Ultimately, you know, the long-term goal of the exchange is that it's no longer somebody saying, hey, I need health insurance on the commercial side or I need Medicaid. It's somebody saying, I need coverage. And the place that I know that I can get trusted coverage and, and be steered in the right direction based on my eligibility determinations is the exchange. So I'm going to go there because I know there are people who can help me make this decision. And then that, the exchange itself will do those determinations and point people to the right direction. Um, as Vinny pointed out, we do have the ability to establish our own state-based exchange. We do anticipate becoming a state-based exchange um, in the very near future. And um, if we don't do it, then the federal government will do it for us. So um, when we moved forward very quickly on that, the goal, I think, and um, has been so far to make sure that we're implementing the right exchange for all individual small businesses in Maryland and for all Marylanders, not what the federal government might come, do, come in and do for us. So we've been lucky enough to be able to pass two sets of legislation. I'll go through the first set of legislation, which was passed in 2011. Um, and as Carolyn has suggested, sets the exchange up as a public corporation and an independent unit of state government. She calls this the best of both worlds. <laughs> um, I don't know if I would call it that. Um, uh, it, it, it is a very interesting place to be. Um, there are, um, you know, being part of the state government is absolutely where we should be. Um, I do appreciate the work that was done in that legislation to allow us to bypass some of the state processes that are in place, and I'll talk a little bit about that later and the impact on the enrollment and eligibility system. Um, as you saw earlier, there are nine board members. We have three ex officio members. We are lucky enough to have Josh Sharstein as the chairman of our board. Um, and there were six appointed, um, three with insurance, type of insurance experience, and three representing consumer interests. Um, and since my PR person put this slide together, she likes to point out that I was the first executive director appointed in the United States. Um, from a stakeholder engagement perspective, again, just to reiterate what Carolyn um, was saying, is that this is really not only a tenant of, of healthcare reform in general, but really something that we've taken to heart at the exchange. We very much have an open, transparent process. All of our meetings are public. All of our board meetings are public. We open all of our advisory committee meetings open for public comment at the end, um, mostly during. Um, the 2011 legislation did require us to do six different studies and create four advisory committees. During those meetings last year, so I came on in September, and the first day that I came on board, um, one of the advisory committees was meeting, and I went to every single one of those meetings that I could. There were several that were at the same time. Um, the, just to listen to what was going on. There were, um, you know, it was cross, clearly cross-functional. We had the health insurance industry, providers, we had community members, advocates, local government officials, consumers. And I often tell a story about how during one meeting it occurred to me that there was a hospital association member sitting next to a broker, sitting next to a consumer advocate, and at the end of the day, they all agreed with each other. And to have that sort of um, collaboration and for everybody to move forward, it really made 
Um, the 2012 legislation, pretty easy. Uh, I'm just going to jump to the and come back to some other stuff. So those advisory committees laid out. Um, uh, so the board needed to make some recommendations to the General Assembly for on December 23rd of last year. We owed a report to the General Assembly on how to be um, an effective exchange. All of those, um, those advisory committee um, discussions actually led the board down this path. And although there were a lot of somewhat could have been perceived as dicey discussions, it really wasn't so because all those advisory committees came together in unison with a direction for an exchange that was right for all Marylanders. So um, those recommendations actually transferred into um, legislation. Um, it was an administration bill written by Carolyn. Um, and um, so we very much are connected at the hip. Um, and the 2012 legislation lays out, among other things, it defines what the navigator program is going to look like compared to the producer uh, market. And I'll get into that a little in a little bit. It really got into how do we make sure that the health insurance exchange does not become a high risk pool? How do we make sure that the um, that carriers are playing equally, that um, uh, that we have the right plans, that individuals aren't going to be um, adver adversely selection or selecting either for or against the exchange. It really was um, a lot of policy work that went in there. Um, let me actually um, just go back to this. From a stakeholder perspective, um, we do have a stakeholder site that um, is visited on a regular basis. Going back to our public piece, all of our minutes or all of our um, presentations are on here. Um, all of our upcoming meetings are on here. All of our requests for proposals are on here. All of our jobs are out here. I'll get into that in a minute as well. Um, so really someplace that people can go and, and get information. Um, and Carolyn did get into this a little bit about the Affordable Care Act and why the Affordable Care Act is important to Maryland, but I want to talk about why the exchange is important to Maryland. It expands access to our 13% of uninsured. So currently we have 730,000 people. Um, I think it might be up, up to 740,000 now who are currently uninsured. So those people today are currently getting their insurance through the hospitals, um, you know, going to the hospital because they don't have uh, uh, any other place to get it. It gives individuals access to primary care physicians and preventive services. Um, as, we, as Carolyn talked about the federal subsidies, it provides an influx, and this number is actually old, and you'll see, you saw on Carolyn's, it's actually $600 million of federal subsidies, new influx into our system. Um, and as you saw on her slide as well, the Affordable Care Act in general creates 9,000 jobs in the first year, 26,000 jobs by 2020. So all of these new funds in the system and the way that people are going to be changing the way that they're actually using health insurance um, is really going to modify and not uh, is going to create jobs and really just infuse a lot into, into Maryland. Um, ultimately, we're looking for to lower unco uncompensated care. Obviously, um, you know, Vinny talked about short and long-term needs to change um, uh, to change the way care is delivered. From a short-term perspective, the exchange is really focused on just getting those uninsured in the system. We want to make sure that we've got enough carriers in the market to offer enough plans that are interesting and um, uh, enough to offer people in the market. So we're starting with an any willing carrier model. Then as we start to get um, uh, enough umph behind us, enough people that we can actually start working directly with the carriers to change the way that they're delivering system, uh, delivering health care. It could possibly be, you know, in 2016 or 2017, hey, listen, you need to have a patient-centered medical home to be able to offer on the exchange or value-based insurance design or whatever the case may be so that once we get the market behind us that we can actually say to the carriers, okay, we've now got enough a market force behind us that we should really be working on it, that's when we're really going to be able to start changing the way that healthcare is delivered. And so that's the long-term goal. The short-term goal, like I said, is really just to get, to get people in. Um, so Maryland Health Connection, a little bit of information about what Maryland Health Connection, which is the portal and entry point for individuals into Medicaid and um, and to, ex and to the exchange. It is the only place that individuals are going to be able to get tax subsidies and cost sharing reductions from the federal government. Um, so the federal government is going to give um, federal subsidies for individuals under 400% of the federal poverty level. As you can see, that's about $44,000 at the bottom. Um, 
me just use an example of somebody at two hundred percent so two hundred percent of federal poverty they're making about twenty two thousand dollars a year the maximum amount of out of pocket that they can pay in premiums is one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars i mean hundred fifteen thousand hundred and fifteen dollars a month uh, <laughs> woo! Um, <laughs> They can, they can only pay $115 a month. It doesn't matter whether the health insurance on the exchange costs $300, $600, whatever that number is, the federal government is filling that gap between $115 and whatever that premium is. So that's where that $600 million of federal subsidies come into the market to support the system. Um, so this is really how, when, when people question, how is it that people who couldn't afford health insurance before are going to be able to afford it now? It's these federal subsidies that are going to be able to allow them to get insurance. And how are they going to get access to that? So first and foremost, we do have MarylandHealthConnection.gov, which is um, our portal. But we know that health insurance is not so easy to buy. It's not so easy to understand. Um, so everybody's going to need assistance. We are required by the Affordable Care Act to set up a navigator program. I'll get into those in a, in a little bit. We absolutely need brokers and the producers in our community to support us. Um, we estimate that we can enroll between 150 and 180,000 people in the first year of the exchange. There are 180 days in our first enrollment, open enrollment period. That's 1,000 people a day that we need to enroll. There is no way that we are going to do that without the brokers and producers in the community that already sell insurance. So we are very much working with the producer community. Um, we are very much ramping up the navigator program. The navigators, um, so the navigators will essentially be helpers in the market, um, need to understand the um, uh, and enrollment and eligibility um, program for Medicaid all the way up and through the tax subsidies and in the insurance market. And so we are going to need a lot of feet on the street from a navigator perspective, helping people understand what they can do. Um, the navigator program and the broker program are going to supplement each other. We will also have a call center that will be um, all-inclusive call center so that carriers can call, individuals can call, small businesses can call, um, really a hands-on um, call center. And then we'll be doing outreach and education. We'll be starting our advertising campaign probably June or July of next year. Um, don't want to do it too soon. We'll have to have our call center up prior to us doing that so that when people see it and they need some place to call, we can, we can answer those questions. Um, but we will, as starting today, we'll continue to be doing events and business outreach and things like that. So just a little bit more about the producers and navigators. Um, the Affordable Care Act requires that navigators conduct public education and outreach, distribute fair and impartial information, um, and offer information in a culturally and linguistically appropriate manner. So when we took a look at that and we de determined what the legislation was going to be for 2012, um, we wanted to make sure that we were, uh, the 2011 legislation made sure that we did not replace the market, that we supplemented the existing market. As we said earlier, we want to make sure that the exchange is right for all Marylanders, and that means not necessarily upsetting the existing market. So. I often say that I personally in the exchange, we're not focused on those people who already have insurance. If you already have insurance, great, stay where you are. We want to focus on those people who are uninsured and make sure that they're getting into the system as much as they can. So navigators, if they're, if somebody is already working with a broker and, and um, that navigator recognizes that they're working with a broker, they need to refer that individual back to that broker so that we're not taking business from the existing brokers. Brokers, as I said, very much um, we want to work with them. They do need to receive training from the exchange um, to be able to do that, so they're up to speed on exactly what the system looks like, understand um, what, the over, what the tax subsidies look like and what the oversight is. And from an oversight perspective, the Maryland Insurance Administration, we work very closely with the Maryland, Maryland Insurance Administration on all of these functions having to do with the insurance side. They have over, um, oversight of these programs. So what can individuals do right now to get health insurance? And, and, and um, taking a look at MarylandHealthConnection.gov, which is up. Um, it is a placeholder site right now. You can link to, um, it does have links to a couple different places like the Maryland Health Insurance Plan, which is our high risk pool, has links to the Maryland Insurance Administration if you have questions about insurance. Um, uh, a couple different, it has links to the Governor's Office of Healthcare Reform website. Um, so it is just a placeholder right now, but you can sign up for email updates. You can sign up for text updates, text connected to 69302. Um, and you can get information on um, you know, what's going on at the exchange. 
So then moving to small businesses, because the exchange isn't just for individuals, it's also for small businesses. And it's um, what the federal government calls the SHOP program, is uh, available for small businesses up to 50 employees, which is the current size of the small group market, um, at least until 2016. In 2016, the Affordable Care Act modifies that small business group to, to 100. But this is a place where um, it's the only place, as with the individual exchange, it's the only place um, that small businesses can get tax credits. And I'll get into the tax credits in a minute. Um, but we will provide employers an innovative, um, the plan options, the plan compare for um, an, an easy way to administer and take a look at the plans that they might want to offer. Um, again, it's the only place to get the tax credits. And we also have an employee choice model. So. Um, Today, if you look at the vertical under carrier B, small businesses, so groups under 50, can only purchase one carrier. Um, in the large group market, so anybody over 50 can purchase, um, uh, the, um, the HR person can go in and say, hey, I want to offer Care First next to Kaiser, next to Aetna and Cigna, and that employee can go in and choose any of those across the board. Um, but in the small group market, they're limited because they, this, the businesses, the carriers were only allowed to offer one. So the Affordable Care Act requires us to be able to offer employee choice. So if you look at the horizontal, what that employer is going to do now is to say, okay, employee, I'm going to still give you your contribution, whether it be 50% or $200 or whatever the case may be. I'm going to choose a meta level for you, and you can choose any of those carriers on the market. And the important thing for us on this is it introduces portability in the small group market. So if I leave, you know, um, ABC company to go to a DEF company, I can take that health insurance with me. So the continuity of care between uh, moving from, you know, I don't have to move from carrier B to carrier C, I can take carrier D with me. So that continuity of care and the transition um, really makes it easier. And that's another way to lower health care costs in the long term. So from a tax credit perspective, today there is a tax credit available for small, small employers. It's 35%. Um, in 2014, that raises to 50%, but you do have to have fewer than the, um, 25 full-time equivalents and an average annual wage of less than $50,000 a year. So this targets probably those groups that haven't been offering um, health insurance before. Um, the, um, in 2014, today you can get it anywhere, obviously. In 2014, it's the, only, the exchange is the only place you can get it. So what's next for small businesses? Um, again, small businesses can go to MarylandHealthConnection.gov. We are encouraging them to talk to CPAs, talking to their brokers if they're already working with brokers to understand what changes might be coming down the pike for them. And then quickly, just to talk about um, our implementation. So, um, you know, as we mentioned, in June of 2011 was the first time that the exchange board met. Um, I came on board in September. And um, so the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange has received $157 million in federal funds to date. We have spent no state funds on anything that is uh, Maryland Health Benefit Exchange specific functions. Um, so we have um, the planning grant, early innovator, and establishment one grant um, were all received prior to me coming on board. Um, those are probably about 90% IT based. And then the level two establishment grant um, we just received in um, August, that's $123 million. That covers us through the end of 2014. Um, this, again, is um, probably 60% IT based. Um, so very much, and I'll get into a little bit of detail about what we're doing with those IT funds. Um, we are looking at a new eligibility and enrollment system. So through the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange, the state procured a new enrollment and eligibility system. This is one of those places where um, we were lucky to be able to be nimble enough to maneuver um, through the system. Um, so, for example, it took us five months from the time that we put the RFP on the street to the time that we actually brought our vendor on board. The new MMIS system in Medicaid took five years for them to bring that, person, that, that vendor on board. So there's no way that if they hadn't thought of smartly enough about this early on that we would have been able to maneuver and, and, and be in place by next year. 
Um, we work very, very, very closely with DHMH and DHR on this because DHR owns the current enrollment and eligibility system. DHMH normally is the one who brings in the money through the federal funds. So um, it's this dance between the three of us to try and um, uh, as we go through the implementation. The phase one of this implementation is for just to get us through October of 2000, uh, to get us to open enrollment and, and really up and running. Phase, phases two and three will begin to incorporate the non-MAGI determination, so long-term care, things like that. And phase three will bring in the social services so that it's all under one system. And somebody getting SNAP, TANF, doesn't matter what they're getting, it's all gonna be enrolled under one system. Um, that is being looked to be complete by 2000, the end of 2015. So from our uh, milestones perspective, um, we did award in March. We be began our development in May. Um, we will begin our first round testing in November the way that we're implementing this. We're implementing this on uh, a sprint perspective. So we're looking every five weeks. Um, we are um, testing and um, beginning and, 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 and looking at it and testing it and moving forward as opposed to a long implementation where you don't actually know whether or not it's working until the very end. Um, we test on a regular basis. Um, but in November will be our first round of end-to-end -end testing. Um, and then in um, two, second quarter of 2013, we will be including external stakeholders to um, continue that tenet that I mentioned earlier about that stakeholder engagement. We'll be um, including them in the um, stakeholder testing. We do plan to go live in July so that um, carriers can be testing with, with us in the production environment. We'll be obviously testing prior to that in the development, um, in development but then as we go live, um, ready for open enrollment in October. And in terms of administration of the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange, so when I came on board in September, um, I was talking to a friend of mine and they said, so where's your office? And I said, I don't have one. <laughs> and they said, well, what's your dress code? And I said, I don't have one. I mean, <laughs> I didn't have a computer, I didn't have a desk, there was nothing, right? So on top of also implementing all of this stuff to be ready for the exchange, we're also in the process of actually developing an organization. So we have um, 11 official uh, members, it's me, and we have a director of operations, director of IT, director of communications, director of plan management, director of policy, a fiscal administrator, we do have um, uh, nine contracted program management office uh, members. They're responsible for implementing the IT piece. We do have Hilltop support, and we do have one extra special intern, JP Cardenas, <laughs> um, who we couldn't live without. Uh, aren't you supposed to be in the office? <laughs> oh, right, okay. Um, and we did just receive 33 pins from Board of Public Works um, in September, and we currently have eight positions posted. We will be posting throughout the year. We do expect the organization to be up to about 70 um, at the end of 2014. Um, the state process that we have to go through gives us pins every couple of, we have to go a couple different times. So instead of getting them all in one fell swoop, we only have 33 right now. But we definitely looked, when we looked at the organizational de development, we wanted to make sure that we weren't bringing everybody on board before we needed to, so it's a very slow and measured um, organization build. Um, and then from a self-sustainability perspective, how is the exchange gonna be sustainable? So we must be self-sustainable by 2015. Um, in the way that we started to begin this process, and there were two studies required. So in the 2011 um, uh, legislation, there was required to be a stakeholder advisory committee and um, a study to determine how we were gonna be self-sustainable by 2015. That advisory committee found that the exchange actually benefits more than just those people who are in the exchange, more than just those people who are um, enrolled in the exchange, and more than just the carriers who are participating on the exchange that we're funneling business to. That the exchange actually benefits all Marylanders because we're gonna lower uncompensated care, we're gonna lower premium costs across the board. Um, and so the exchange board made a recommendation in that report last December that the funding should be both broad-based and transactional. So again, because we're funneling business to those carriers, they should be paying us just like they pay uh, third-party administrators in the market today and brokers in the market today they should be paying us for the business that we're sending their direction so that's the transaction piece but because it's also a very um, uh, we're not totally sure how it's going to work out and we want it's a little bit volatile for the first couple of years for sure we want to make sure that we have some sort of broad-based funding mechanism coming in as well 
But what we determined is that the 2012 um, legislative session wasn't the right time to actually address this in detail. And so instead of actually trying to push through um, a, a funding mechanism, when there was still some uncertainty, the Supreme Court was still out there, we just still weren't sure whether or not it was gonna move forward, um, we made the decision to actually do another study. And so the 2012 um, legislation creates a joint executive, bipartisan executive legislative committee to make a re recommendation to the governor and general assembly in December. Um, we do have um, two senators and two delegates on that. And what we're doing this year, different from last year, is we're building on the work that was done last year to move forward with this broad-based and transaction-based um, model, but we're getting into more detail. So we're working with a consultant right now to finalize what our operating budget looks like. This is getting into details of how much are we gonna pay the navigators, uh, how many people are you gonna have on board, like what is the actual operating budget that you have? Um, and we're taking that number and we're going to put actual funding, the, when, when you create the broad-based funding stream, what percent does that um, funding stream need to, to get to to get to your operating budget number? So we'll come back with some specific numbers. Um, there is, the report is out for public comment right now through October 22nd. Um, the committee will be meeting in early um, November to receive information on the actual budget and to the feedback on um, the public comment. And then there will be a committee meeting in mid-November to make a final recommendation, which will then go to the report, which will then ultimately end up in Annapolis um, for legislation in 2013. And so what's next for us? So obviously we're gonna keep continuing moving forward on the IT piece. That is our critical path. We, um, you know, we have a couple critical paths, but we really need to get to the IT piece up and running. Um, we are very focused on working with the carriers right now because we're trying to build the store, but if the carriers don't come and put their products in their store, there's really nothing for us to sell. So um, we are working very closely with that. We do have a lot of policy development that's going on right now over the next couple of months to the exchange board. We're working on the navigator pieces, um, how shop's going to function, how we're going to manage our appeals and grievances program. Um, we do have regulations going through the AELR process right now. We will probably have those continuing through um, next year, probably further. Um, like I said earlier, we do expect federal certification when they grant certification. Um, uh, we do anticipate that we will be conditionally certified. We have heard from um, the federal government that they do not expect to um, fully certify any state um, between now uh, in their first round because I think the exact quote was, unless there's some, um, I can't remember it now what it was, but something about space time continuum and actually having your IT system up and ready to go nine months before you actually need it, they understand that that's not gonna happen. So they'll conditionally certify us on our policies and our plans to move forward and then the IT pieces will be check-ins at a later date. Um, as I said, outreach and education, um, we will continue moving forward with, and an open enrollment is in October. So, fast and furious. <laughs> Well, I would like to make it back. That was a big hand for Caroline back. A great, great presentation. Very lucky, very lucky to have both of them. I'd like to now open up to questions, and um, all of you in here are certainly welcome to ask questions. We have people online who can ask questions. Ayana will bring those to me. If you want to ask a question, try to speak loudly so we can hear you and tell your name, where you're from. And Ayana has a mic. There you go. Any questions? Well, some people online have questions. Okay. Uh, not too long. Um, are, are you privy, I, I don't know if this is the Carolyn or Becca, but whoever wants to answer. Are you privy to say the name or names of the pilot medical home model currently in operation? And do you have any preliminary numbers of success or operations? So medical home question. So I think, I think when I brought up the patient-centered medical home piece, it was just an example of what uh, what something might be in the market. There are, like you said, Carolyn, there are two pilots in the market right now. Um, I don't know if they've been in the market long enough to actually get data on whether or not um, they are bending the cost curve. Um, I'm sure if you spoke to CareFirst, they would say that it is. So um, that was just an example from my perspective. 
and i don't have the numbers at my fingertips but if you go to the maryland health care commission website there is a special link to the patient medical patient centered medical home all payer pilot which is the state pilot and then care first i'm sure has has information on its website there are there are again i don't have the numbers but there are a lot of physician practices um, participating in both the state pilot and the care first pilot Th thank you and let me just say from the perspective of our healthcare for all coalition patient centered medical homes a very important way to make health care more affordable and the legislation which we've talked about earlier which allows the exchange to conduct active purchasing to really encourage ways to make healthcare affordable, specifically references patient-centered medical homes and, and value-based insurance as, as, as policies that they can pursue, and we hope, we hope they do. So thank you very much. Next question from online. Um, has there been a, a definitive decision on what will happen to an individual in Maryland if they are not insured, i.e. penalties? I assume they're referring to what the penalties are for not getting the required insurance under the ACA. And, and that's defined by the Affordable Care Act, right. not necessarily by us. Um, I think in the first year, it's $95. Um, I think it ramps up to 695 after year three. Right, and, and th those are, as, as Becca said, defined in the National Affordable Care Act. And there has been some people who've criticized it as people aren't gonna do it, they're too low. But Massachusetts experience shows that these kind of penalties work. The penalties in Massachusetts are very similar to those under the Affordable Care Act, and the vast majority of people have gotten the insurance, and very, very few people have paid the penalties. Anything else on that? Or? Okay. Um, one other question. Um, why did the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, reduce health care flexible savings account maximums from 5000 to 2500 I have no idea. I do not know. Do I? Sorry, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Um, any other questions here? Yes. Wait, wait, here's a mic from Mayana. Tell, tell us your name. Uh, Carlo Perico, we're at the School of Medicine. Uh, I came in a little late, so I apologize if I missed this. But um, to what extent will employees of medium and large employers, if the employer chooses to pay the employer mandate, uh, and will their employees then have access to the exchange? Uh, and have you kind of talked to uh, medium and large sized businesses and gotten a feel for if anyone is planning on paying that? I believe it's a $2,000 per employee penalty and then having their, 30, employers, right. their employees come onto the exchange. Right, so the, the penalty, um, I hope I don't make this up, but the penalty is $2,000 per employee over 30 employees. It is 50. Um, no, the group size over 50, oh. but over 30. So your first 30 employees are free, essentially, if you drop coverage. Um, yes, they are eligible to come in. Individuals are eligible to come into the exchange and get subsidies. So the only way an individual, if they're offered employee sp or employer sponsored coverage, they can't get subsidies in the exchange, um, even in the uh, small group or large group market. Um, if the group does drop coverage, then they can come get into the exchange and they can get subsidies. Um, anecdotally, we have been talking to large groups and, and to um, consultants, and there, there are definitely pay or play models out there for, for those groups to try and determine what they want to do. But there's still a paternal, maternal feeling for large groups, and there's still a reason to offer coverage. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice benefit to be able to offer. And so at least in the first year, our model doesn't assume that there are going to be a lot of large groups dropping coverage. Thank you, Becca. Very good. Kevin? I don't think I need the mic unless okay. you need it for uh, online purposes. I, I have a question for Becca, maybe for Carolyn as, as well. I think we do for online purposes. Okay. You need to get up. Kevin, it's up here. Right, right here. My area, Kevin. We're making you work. Yeah. You are loud, Kevin, but not that loud. Thank you. I have a question for, for Becca and maybe for Carolyn as well. Um, one of the other large things that happens in, in 2014 is, as everyone knows, in addition to the exchange operating, is Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk about, I, I know Maryland's paying a lot of attention to the relationship between Medicaid and the exchange, and particularly those who might be eligible for one or the other or both at different times over, over the mm -hmm. course of the year. Just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what 
um, has been done so far to, to address that? Thing? Sure, absolutely. So Sarah Rosenbaum, I think, estimates or did a study and estimates that um, uh, people will churn, uh, which is really the, the move, movement between the exchange and uh, Medicaid, uh, four times a year um, for those people between under 200%. Um, so we very much are taking a look at that. There is a continuity of care advisory committee. We are required statutorily to have a study to the General Assembly on what we're going to do to address that. That advisory committee right now is taking a look specifically at what, um, uh, sp when I think of continuity of care, it can be this big, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can talk about continuity of, um, you know, uh, I, I where do I pay my bill sort of continuity stuff. But this is specifically focused on um, if somebody's in the mi middle of a treatment plan, how do we make sure that they don't have to, um, you know, get a, a new pre-auth or anything like that and that the, the new carrier is responsible for um, supporting the treatment plan that they're already in. So what we're doing is we're taking a look at not only what Medicaid does across the country today and in the state, what the commercial carriers do today and in this um, and in the country. Um, and CQA already has some standards that are already in place. And um, the committee is trying to pare down some specific things that the exchange should be looking at. We're doing this in concert with Medicaid and the Maryland Insurance Administration so that um, the ultimate goal is to have legislation in 2013 so that um, that whatever we put in place isn't just exchange specific, that it's across the entire market so that we, you don't have any risk issues. Thank you. Uh, let me just say on the Medicaid point, you, as you all probably know, the Supreme Court, when it upheld the Affordable Care Act, did say, unfortunately, that states are not going to be required to do the Medicaid expansion and states are deciding whether or not uh, to do it. And I have a lot of colleagues in other states who are very upset that their governors or general assembly are saying we're not going to do this. I think we can say clearly in Maryland that Governor O'Malley and Maryland will do the Medicaid expansion, which is a key part of it. Isn't that right, Carolyn? Yeah. <laughs> right. Question? Okay. Hi, my name is Jelani. I'm a student in the School of Public Health. And I don't know that much about the uh, business side of things, but the, the, there's a lot of talk from conservatives that you can't really force businesses that have over 50 employees to pay for health insurance because they might choose not to hire new people. I wanted to know if there's anything in the law that like protects businesses from that so they won't be forced to make cuts. I don't, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense, but that's the argument that's given for businesses. Right, so this goes um, back to the penalty. So um, businesses under 50 are not required to offer insurance, um, but there is a penalty for businesses over uh, 50 employees to offer insurance. Uh, if they don't offer insurance, they do have to pay $2,000 per individual over 30 people, so from 31 to whatever their number is. Um, uh, the, again, I would say that's where the pay or, pay or play model comes in about whether or not. Now, interestingly, 89% of businesses between 50 and 150 offer health insurance today. So uh, that's I can't imagine that there are going to be too many um, businesses that are in that situation. And, and let me just say, from our perspective, we have always believed in the fair share theory that businesses that are large, that can afford health care, need to do so because if they're not chipping in, their employees go to the hospital, we all pay, it increases our insurance premium. So we've always believed that large ins employers need to do their fair share and the Affordable Care Act requires that. Yes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. We heard about you. You should know this answer. <laughs> <laughs> I should. Um, this is just a general uh, body question. Um, with the employer versus employee choice diagram that you displayed, are employers only relegated, um, are employees only relegated to choose from the plan that em the employers decide from? And what are their options if uh, if an employee chooses to purchase a um, a platinum or a gold plan when the employer only offers silver plans? So that was actually a lot of discussion last year about how, how, how wide was the employee choice going to be. Um, you know, there were some options that we could take it even further and allow the carrier to just give $200 or whatever the number is, and they could pick, pick anything they wanted on the, um, on the exchange. But because of the risk, right, so as you as an individual are going to know whether or not or anticipate 
you can anticipate what you think your health needs are going to be in the following year. So um, to mitigate the risk factor from allowing somebody to, from one year to say, hey, I just need the, um, the um, bronze plan. Um, and then next year, for example, maybe I say, hey, I think I'm going to get pregnant. I'm going to go and purchase the platinum plan. That would cause a lot of um, problems in the market. So the decision was to just allow the carrier to, to choose that one metal level and to be for the individual um, to be able to choose any carrier on that metal level. Um, we will take a look at it in the coming years and assess it and try and figure out whether or not we can open it up further than that. Um, but more than they have today where the employer chooses the carrier and if they're lucky they get two or three plans to choose from a lot of times it's just one single plan to choose from so it does open up at least more employee choice than they have today becca before we go on could, could you uh, describe a little bit of what the metal plans mean sure what that means for you sure so um the metal levels um as you saw up there they are metal levels because they're called platinum um, so gold, silver, and bronze, um, they are the actuarial value. So a platinum plan, um, any, any plan uh, at the platinum level, the actuarial value of it, or the estimated costs to the individual um, compared to the average cost of the plan, I don't think I'm really saying that right, but it's hard to explain, but your average out-of-pocket costs, um, the platinum plan will cover 90% of your costs. The gold plan should cover 80, the um, silver plan should cover 70, and the bronze plan should cover 60%. So, um, you know, the average person spending, you know, $1,000 will pay, not, um, the plan will pay $900 and the individual will pay, pay $100 plus your premium in the platinum plan. That's a very good explanation. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Lee and I'm a student at the School of Public Health. So granted that right now we're just looking at how to implement things, but in the long run, how do you see, what do you see as the changing roles and responsibilities of the exchange itself once uh, access has been significantly expanded? Haven't gotten that far. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple things will probably change. First and foremost, um, the Maryland Health Insurance Plan um, members. Today there are 20,000 members who are covered under the Maryland Health Insurance Plan, which is the high risk pool, is going to go away. So those individuals are going to roll into the exchange. Um, but there are several pieces that MHIP runs today that um, there's a senior prescription drug assistance program that the exchange might possibly take over. Um, but on top of that, um, one of the things that the exchange has to do is um, run a reinsurance program for the state. Um, so we will definitely take that piece on as well. Um, I don't anticipate any major changes in the long run where we, um, I mean, we won't you know, begin to become an insurance plan or anything like that. Um, I think ultimately it's going back to what Vinny said, which is how do we start to work with the carriers? And so on an ongoing basis, we'll be trying to modify the way that care is delivered within the state. Um, to, you know, once, especially we expand the small group market to 100 and we really gain more people in the exchange, we'll have that ability to start um, driving some of the change in the market. So instead of just being up and running, it will be that, that force behind some working with the carriers to change things. The only thing I would add to that is that the other piece that some people thought was important when we were having the initial, you know, sort of controversy and ultimately decision about what kind of body it would be, um, there's a requirement that a study be done in a couple of years to determine whether or not it would now be better to kind of morph it into a nonprofit or remain a public corporation. Great. Thank you both. I have a few more questions from our online audience. Um, this person is saying, in the last two presidential debates, Governor, Governor Romney has mentioned that if elected, his intent is to repeal the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, or however much of it hasn't already been implemented. If he is elected this November, how will Maryland respond? That's yours, Carolyn. That's all yours. <laughs> um, well, I think, Unlike the Supreme Court decision, where there could have been an immediate and definitive effect on how and whether states could go forward, I think if um, if Romney wins re -ele wins, elect wins the the election, his promise to quote repeal it on day one is is just a fallacy. Um, 
<laughs> and I'll, I'll let it go at that. So if it, but if he then makes more meaningful moves as time goes on to try to take away parts of it, um, we will do what we've done from the beginning, which is to say, you know, we obviously have a huge amount of political leadership and public support for the Affordable Care Act here in Maryland and the implementation efforts. So we will gather together with our partners in the General Assembly and um, our, all of our stakeholders and sort of look at what he's doing and look at the effect of it on what we're doing and, and figure out the best way to move forward. But let me just add, Ayanna, that um, as I said earlier, before the Affordable Care Act took effect, Maryland was already making tremendous progress. And uh, we have expanded health care to 300,000 people, allow young people up to age 25 to stay in their parents' health care, and did much else. And we were looking at proposals like what's in the Affordable Care Act. So if, if, if that happens and the Federal Affordable Care Act is gone, which, like Carolyn, I don't think is going to happen, but if that happens, we're going to all work hard in Maryland to make sure the progress continues. Okay, I believe this one is for Rebecca. Where can we find the descriptions for those eight new positions and how we go about <laughs> applying? Yay! Um, so they um, are on our website. There is a link off the front page um, to um, link to the actual further um, on the pages. Um, the positions that we have posted, we have a deputy director of operations, we have a deputy director of IT, we have um, a PR manager, we have a special assistant, a compliance manager, an HR manager, and somebody that I'm forgetting, uh, one or two people I'm forgetting, but those are the positions. So. Okay, great. Um, what are the minimum requirements of an employer to avoid the penalty? What if they offer insurance but make employees pay a higher percentage of the cost? That's a good question. So um, the employer, the coverage for the employee must be less than 9.5% of their income for it to be considered um, ESI or employer sponsored coverage. Okay, and this is the last one I have online. Well, there are two. What were the controversial issue, issues in setting up the exchange and were there compromises made regarding control over the carriers? I'll talk about 2012 and then turn it over to you guys to talk about 2011. Um, so in 2012, um, the, the only one real piece of, um, uh, I think that was, and it wasn't even really controversy, but pushback that we got was to move to the active purchasing model in 2016. Um, and thanks to Vinny and others, um, we were uh, allowed to actually keep it in the bill. We, um, uh, I think that's the big one. I think from a carrier perspective, there is um, some inf some uh, a requirement in the legislation that a carrier that um, offers outside the exchange, once they hit a certain threshold from a, um, a premium revenue, um, they have an obligation to, to um, also offer coverage inside the exchange. Um, and actually through Carolyn's process of really um, being very transparent and, and very collaborative, that actually did not end up being something, although I anticipated that it might be um, something that was controversial, it was not because of the process that we used. Um, in terms of the first year, I've alluded to probably the biggest one was whether or not it would be a public corporation, a state entity, or whether it would be a, um, a nonprofit. We also had, um, you know, change is hard, and there was a, one group whose livelihood they viewed themselves as sort of the most vulnerable in terms of what it would do to their li livelihood, and those were the insurance brokers. And so, again, I, I credit um, the process that we we took pains to set up and then and then were be really benefited from people participating in whereby we we kind of got gathered everybody together and worked very hard to fashion a, a framework and governance structure for the exchange that kept everybody in the tent and I, I think we were able to reassure the brokers with the reality of the fact as <laughs> As um, Secretary Sharfstein used to put it in the legislative, you know, arena when we were sort of hammering all this out, if um, if we sort of, you know, plopped down from Mars and were told we had to, uh, you know, enroll a thousand people a day or whatever it is in insurance, and we were told that there was a group of people out there who were really good at this and had been doing it for a very long time, 
why wouldn't we enlist their help? And right. so that was sort of the, the principle on which we moved forward. Um, and so the only other controversy that I, that I remember being a, a sticking point was the board. And I think this was important um, because st different states are struggling with this still even in sort of what kinds of folks do you want on the board of the Health Benefit Exchange. And we took the view that we didn't want direct conflicts of interest. We thought the integrity of the board was really important, so we didn't want actual carriers on the board or actual brokers or, or um, uh, folks who had, had a real, you know, sort of would, would be in a transactional relationship with the exchange. But we wanted the expertise that we needed to really make it successful. So we have some terrific consumer advocates and some terrific folks with real experience in in um, healthcare financing and, and, and healthcare, and we put those requirements in the law so that that will carry forward as the board, you know, over time changes. I, I want to repeat uh, Becca's wonderful story earlier about seeing the hospital, consumer, and broker people together and discussing, going back and forth, and coming to agreement. That's not easy, and I think Carolyn and Becca deserve a lot of credit for making that happen over the last couple of years. Hi, my name's Liz and I work at the Baltimore City Health Department. I had a question about the one single entry point for Medicaid. So my understanding is that people will have to use the exchange to enroll, one, go through the eligibility requirements and enroll in Medicaid. And I just want to confirm that and also ask when you say that the exchange will eventually in phase three become the single entry point for all sort of assistance programs, including SNAP. When do you anticipate that happening? Um, so I should clarify, yes and yes, and yes, but with a caveat. So um, the exchange itself, so the system, the enrollment and eligibility system, which we call the HICS, underlying the um, entry point will be the single entry point. So it's replacing CARES today. Um, uh, so, yes, it will be the only place that people can enter for Medicaid. Um, and phase two and phase three, we expect to be done by 2000, the end of 2015. And phase two is the non-MAGI, so long-term care. Um, and then um, uh, phase three are the social services. That's great. Any other questions? Anything else online, Diana? No, it's online. Okay. Thank you very much, Carolyn Becker. Thank you, Thank you all for everybody. joining us for the October Grand Rounds. Tune in next month. Um, our topic will be distracted driving, so that should be pretty interesting. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ayana. Thank you.